respected teachers senior iapns and dear colleagues good evening and welcome to today's program uh, coming 17th is the world hemophilia day and it is sad that iap is organizing a program based on hemophilia for the awareness i thank the iap leaders for inviting me for this talk so we go to the topic topic proper hemophilia as you are aware is a congenital coagulation defect there is deficiency of either factor 8 or factor 9 leading to hemophilia a or hemophilia b it's the most common severe inherited bleeding disorder perhaps the most common disorder may be von willebrand's fa factor deficiency but majority of them are mild and will not come to clinical attention so the one which comes to clinical attention is a hemophilia patients this an age old illness recognized even in biblical times the word hemophilia was coined in the university of zurich in 1803 the deficiency of factor was found out in 1947 factor 8 concentrates were introduced into treatment in 1965 the genes for hemophilia were cloned in 1985 and recombinant factor is produced in 1989 now most recently we have a new molecule called emesizumab in the treatment of hemophilia that has come to use uh, for the past 3 uh, to 4 years now this is picture sh just shows the deficiency of the factor you know the cascade is broken in between by the deficiency of either factor 8 or factor 9 you have a clot but the clot is not robust and the wound will start oozing Uh, immediately now hemophilia is found in 1 out of 5000 male births 80 to 85% have hemophilia a and the rest hemophilia b they are classified into mild moderate and severe depending on the basal level of factor as you are aware any factor the level is expressed as percentage 50 to 150 is the routine level of factor percentage and in hemophilia severe forms the percentage of factor is less than 1% in moderate hemophilia the factor level is 1 to 5% and in mild hemophilia it is 5 to 40% coming to clinical manifestations uh, 1 to 2% of neonates develops intracranial bleeds so most of them will present only during the second half of infancy but there is a risk of neonates presenting with intracranial bleeds probably due to instrument delivery either vacuum or forceps now 30% bleed with circumcision so if the baby is undergo circumcision in the first few months without knowing that they are uh, uh, suffering from hemophilia it is likely that they will bleed and come to clinical attention otherwise unless there is a family history these babies may go unnoticed they become symptomatic during the second half of infancy that is when they starts uh, crawling or uh, when one year when, uh, when they start walking sometimes they present you with the subcutaneous bleeds also Now the first major joint to bleed is the ankle joint. Even though hemophilia is a systemic hemorrhagic disease, hemophilic bleeds occur in fairly limited sites. So each bleeding disorder has a predilection for certain sites. Just like uh, we say uh, thrombocytopenia bleeds from mucous membrane and skin, we have hemophilia bleeding from specific sites. They are classified into non-life threatening bleeds and life threatening bleeds. The non-life threatening bleeds which form the majority of their problem they are the joint bleeds muscle bleeds subcutaneous bleeds epistaxis gum bleeds and gastrointestinal bleeds the life threatening threatening bleeds are intracranial bleeds bleeding in and around the airways iliopharyngeal bleed major trauma like a road traffic accident then massive gastrointestinal bleeds so these are the life threatening bleeds now if you look at the frequency of different types of bleeds hemarthrosis constitutes 70 to 80% of their bleeds muscles some um, muscles and subcutaneous bleeds comes second with 10 to 20% and the rest being around 5 5 to 10% you have life threatening bleeds as mentioned earlier now coming to each bleed musculoskeletal bleeding it is a hallmark of hemophilia hemophilic patients quite often suffer from musculoskeletal bleeding in fact a severe hemoph hemophilic child is likely to undergo 1 to 6 bleeds per month this may vary at uh, some season he may not bleed at some other season he may bleed even up to 6 times a month then as uh, mentioned earlier ankle joint is the first major joint to bleed knees and elbows more likely in older children 
then this uh, intraarticular bleed stops by the when the when there is a tamponade that is intraarterial pressure usually more than intraarticular but when there is a tamponade the reverse occurs and the bleeding stops so you need a tamponade to stop the bleeding unless you treat it properly if an inadequately treated repeated bleeding will lead to progressive deterioration of joints the origin of bleeding is the synovium and with the repeated bleeding you get flexion deformities now frequency of hemarthrosis knee is the most common site 45% of hemophilic bleed from the knee joint elbow 30% ankle 15% shoulder wrist and hip constitutes 3% each now the earliest feature of a joint bleed is a, a twingling or a bubbling sensation which most of the hemophilics can uh, most of the older children can realize pain swelling warmth and limitation movements are the hallmark of hemophilic arthritis so the goal of treatment is to treat early if you can give a factor just when there is a feeling of uh, this tingling sensation then you can prevent further bleeding and repeated bleeding into the same joint will lead to development of target joints by definition target joint means more than 3 episodes of bleeding into the same joint within a period of 6 months such a joint is called target joints target joints will uh, bleed repeatedly and uh, each bleed will be more painful than the other one because of the uh, damage caused by the previous bleed now this picture shows the uh, different stages the initial stage of bubbling tingling and uh, warmth later the phase of real hemarthrosis where there is swelling pain heat and limitation of movement then repeated bleeding can finally lead to chronic synovitis where you get a bogy swollen joint with the muscle wasting morning stiffness chronic pain and limited movements now coming to intramuscular hematoma this often will have a elusive vague feeling of pain only at times circumference of the limb is increased and uh, compartment bleeds can occur especially in the forearm or in the calf where the pain will be much more than anticipated and uh, most important muscle bleeds are those affecting the flexor groups and if the neurovascular bundles are involved you can get dist uh, distal pallor and pulselessness and severe muscular contractures can follow if it is not properly treated you can have muscular contractures then atrophy and fibrosis follows this is a compartment bleed of the forearm you can see the neurovascular neurovascular bundle being affected now one important uh, muscle bleed which needs special mention is the iliopsoas hemorrhage as i mentioned earlier it is a life threatening hemorrhage because iliopsoas is one of the largest muscles in the body it can accommodate a huge amount of blood then the symptoms may be a vague lower abdominal pain or a pain in the groin but the gait is very characteristic you can see the child walking with a slightly flexed hip joint so unable to extend the limb fully and the close dd is a hemarthrosis of the hip and we can differentiate by the clinical examination that is if it is a iliopsoas hemorrhage extension is not possible whereas if it is a joint bleed internal rotation is not possible internal rotation or any uh, rotation of the hip joint is not possible so by doing a clinical examination you can distinguish between iliopsoas and a hip joint bleed now it should be confirmed by either ultrasound or a ct scan coming to oral bleeds oral bleeds can uh, occur in different ways the child can bleed uh, during tooth eruption during tooth extraction during uh, falling of uh, primary tooth then a torn frenulum can bleed and uh, one important aspect to remember is oral cavity is a site of abundant fibrinolytic activity so the clot that is formed may get uh, destroyed easily because of the fibrinolytic activity not only that uh, the children uh, push with their tongue on the clot and uh, clot can get easily dislodged so oral bleeding is a is a difficult uh, situation to treat Uh, fortunately we have this anti fibrinolytic uh, agents like uh, tranexamic acid which can be used as a mouth solution or a oral tablet uh, mouth rinse is uh, usually advised as 10 ml of 5% solution used as a mouth rinse for 2 minutes 4 times daily for 7 days unfortunately that solution is no no not available you can prepare it from the tablet or you can make a paste of the paste with the tablet and use it applying pressure on the bleeding site on the oral cavity now hematuria hematuria can occur spontaneously the site of bleeding in the renal tract is difficult to locate uh, sudden abnormal pain may point to a ureteric obstruction and uh, 
possibility of a developing hydronephrosis. And dysuria is uncommon along with the renal bleeds. Now gastrointestinal bleeds, they are difficult to locate. From peptic ulcer to hemorrhoids, they can bleed. Hematemesis, melina, mass, intestinal obstruction, pain, etc. are uh, different clinical features. If there is a massive bleed, you can have significant pallor. In fact, some uh, ten, 10 years back, we have lost a baby in SAT due to gastrointestinal bleed. In fact, he came to ICU with a hemoglobin of 1.5. And before we could arrange uh, blood transfusion, he died. In fact, uh, the parents didn't realize that there is an ongoing bleed because uh, nobody looks at the stool. And he had uh, possibly ongoing blood loss through GIT for uh, maybe weeks or even months. Now, coming to chronic complications of hemophilia. The complications are mainly related to inhibitors and uh, joint problems. Recurrent hemarthrosis, as I mentioned earlier, leads to target joints. Then they develop chronic synovitis. The next stage is chronic hemophilic arthropathy. Then you can get contractures, fractures, development of inhibitors and transfusion transmitted infections. These are the chronic complications we expect in a hemophilic child. Coming to chronic synovitis, with repeated bleeding, the synovium becomes chronically inflamed, it hypertrophies, joint is grossly swollen, but uh, it is not tense, it is just a, just have a baggy look. It is neither tense nor painful, but the muscles around the joints are atrophied, even though the range of motion is preserved. Diagnosis by physical examination as well as by MRI and ultrasound. You can look for changes in the joint. I just mentioned the I will just mention the treatment of chronic synovitis. Control the synovitis and uh, preserve the joint function. The options include you can give a short course of secondary prophylaxis. I will come to prophylaxis later. Then physiotherapy including daily exercise. Intra-articular injection of a long-acting steroid is another option. A course of uh, COS2 inhibitors. You cannot give uh, NSAIDs, every, every NSAID because it, uh, it's a bleeding disorder. But COS2 inhibitors are advised. Then functional bracing can be, orthopedic intervention can be done. If all these fail, if chronic symptoms persist not controlled by other means, you can think of chemical or radioisotopical synoviorthesis and arthroscopic or open surgical synovectomy. So these are the options. You can either go for surgical synovectomy or a radioisotopic or chemical synoviorthosis. Non-surgical synovectomy is the procedure of choice. So we don't prefer, usually prefer surgical method. This is very cumbersome, troublesome. Radioisotopical synovectomy using yttrium-90 is highly effective and has few side effects and can be done in outpatient setting. Uh, this is done in uh, Vellur. But uh, they have strict criteria. Chronic synovitis patients, if uh, other measures fail, you can refer to Velo. Then coming to chronic hemophilic arthropathy. So chronic arthropathy follows chronic synovitis. The repeated bleeding into the same joint will leave some amount of blood remaining in the joint. During the initial attacks, most of the blood is reabsorbed. But as uh, more and more frequent attacks occur, uh, blood remains in the joint cavity and these white cells release proteolytic enzymes. The heme ion can lead to macrophage proliferation and as a result you get a thickening of synovium. This thickened synovium will produce frond like projections into the joint. They get pinched easily and they uh, contribute to recurrent blades. Ultimately the joint cartilage is eroded, the bony surface is exposed, there will be subchondral cyst formation. The exposed bony surface will lead to angulosis of the joint, bony angulosis. Then again, possible fibrosis and uh, swelling will come down with the onset of fibrosis. Now, the treatment options for uh, uh, chronic hemophilic arthropathy are supervised physiotherapy, very important, adequate pain relief, serial casting or bracing, and if these measures fail, you have surgical options like. Uh, joint replacement, contractor release, uh, arthroscopic release of adhesions, arthrodesis of uh, different joints like an angle joint arthrodesis, etc. Now, infections, uh, not a big problem nowadays because we are now using pure fact rate concentrates. In the yesterday years, we were using uh, plasma or even blood. 
at that time infections blood borne infections were a very, very common risk now hepatitis b c hiv hepatitis a parvovirus b19 all these are these were possible on those days now we are focusing on uh, uh, clotting factor con concentrates and the risk of infections are less likely with the more and more advanced uh, uh, technology now coming to carriers few carriers have factor level in the hemophilic range so if you do the factor assessment of a carrier they will have a factor uh, percentage around 50 so in the lower limit of normal and rarely some of them will have a factor level close to that of a mild hemophilic and in a rare occasion where there is unfavorable lionization that is the defective x chromosome taking over as a predominant x in such a situation you can have a carrier with a factor level in the severe range severe hemophilic range such things are also possible and uh, each case should be managed as hemophilia of the corresponding severity and menorrhage is also a problem and uh, luckily antifibrinolytic agents are useful in menorrhage also now coming to antenatal diagnosis of hemophilia you can do chronic chorionic villus sampling between 9 and 11 weeks amniosynthesis between 16 and 18 weeks fetal blood sampling after 16 weeks so from these samples you can uh, do the karyotyping as well as the uh, mutation analysis but uh, remember you always need the proband the initial case suppose a mother is pregnant and he had a uh, elder son having hemophilia you need to test the child also you have to find out the gene mutation happened in that child only then you can detect the detect whether the current fetus is involved or not now coming to the management aspects comprehensive care of hemophilic patients because they have different issues it can be physical bleeding deformities inhibitors social issues so you need a multidisciplinary team to manage them so such a team constitutes the comprehensive care team so comprehensive care promotes physical health psychosocial health and improves the quality of life prevention of bleeding and as well as prompt management of bleeding long-term management of muscles and joints then management of complications including inhibitors and infections and uh, you need a team of healthcare professionals it should be headed by either a physician or a pediatrician and the team should include orthopedicians dentist physiatrist physiotherapist psychologist surgeon maybe neurosurgeon so it's a very vast team and most importantly an s coordinator an s coordinator is an important person in the team he has direct uh, is the first contact for the patient so most often a very very key person the nurse coordinator now coming to general principles of management one one important thing is you have to treat bleeds early as early as possible when a tingling sensation in the joint you can start uh, giving factor try to treat all bleeds with factor and avoid ffp nowadays factor is freely available so ffp is out of question if possible teach them self administration or home administration again treat bleeds first investigate later this is very important at times we may come across a hemophilic child with a head injury so you cannot wait for a ct scan and uh, confirm there is an intracranial bleed to start giving factor so straight away treat the child give a uh, dose of factor then only go for investigations then avoid drugs like aspirin and nsids which are anti platelet which can lead to bleeding avoid head trauma during delivery so avoid uh, instrument delivery like uh, forceps or vacuum in, if the expected child is a uh, bleeding disorder child having baby having bleeding disorder as far as possible avoid circumcision avoid arterial puncture vena puncture then regarding infants and toddlers the home environment should be protected uh, shops should be kept away from children shirts and trousers can be padded internally also while selecting uh, toys uh, you have to be careful during selection of toys toys with sharp edges should be avoided the use of seat belts while driving very important routine dental checkup dental hygiene should be is very important uh, start cleaning the tooth twice daily as early as possible then avoid intramuscular injections wherever hospital they visit they should tell the, that they are hemophilics and uh, you avoid intramuscular injections whenever there is pain give adequate pain relief 
use appropriate vaccinations, encourage healthy lifestyles, prevent obesity. Obesity is one of the major reasons for uh, recurrent uh, joint breeds because uh, the joint has to uh, bear the, uh, this uh, excess weight. Hmm? So have a healthy lifestyle. Then older children, they should avoid contact sports. The sports where they are likely to come into collision between them or uh, they use um, uh, sticks for playing like that. You encourage swimming, cycling, etc. In fact, these two are very, very important uh, exercise methods because most of the muscles uh, are used during swimming and cycling, etc. And uh, they are unlikely to come into collision. Then strong muscles support joints. So joint breed will come down when the muscles are strong. Look for and actively bleed all, actively manage all infections in children. Now coming to prophylactic therapy. Now the concept. What is this prophylactic therapy? As the word explains, prevention of bleeding. Any prophylaxis means you are preventing something. Now if you look at the hemophilic patients, there is a lot of difference between a mild, moderate and a severe. The severe hemophilics have a very, very difficult life. There is a threat of bleeding any day. Whereas a moderate hemophilic will bleed only occasionally or when challenged. And a mild hemophilic will have a near normal life and he will only bleed when there is, when there is a severe challenge. So, if you can convert a severe hemophilic to a mild one or a moderate one, it makes a lot of difference to his uh, quality of life. Now, it has been found that if you can give two or three injections of factor each week to a severe hemophilic child, on any given day, the factor recovery will be more than 1%. That is, if you can give an injection on Monday and if you can test the child's blood on Wednesday, you can still recover at least 1% of factor rate. So, by doing that, by giving two or three injections, you are making sure the child will have a factor level of more than 1% on any given occasion. That is the concept of giving prophylactic therapy. Uh, we are administering factor 8 at regular intervals to prevent bleeding. For target joints, you can use secondary prophylaxis. I will come to that. Then you have different protocols. There is a Swedish protocol. There is a French protocol. They use different units. For example, 25 to 40 per kg. In some studies, 15 to 20 units per kg. In some other studies, in fact, uh, it is given three or two times and there is not much difference between these units. You can even select a lower level. But the only problem is the huge cost involved. Prophylaxis has been shown to decrease joint bleeding with preservation of joint function and improved quality of life. However, it is an expensive treatment can be accomplished only if significant resources are allocated to hemophilia. And uh, even though it is costly, the, uh, it becomes a cost effective measure in the long, long term. And uh, there are studies going on to define the minimum dose. Now, actually, in the Western world, they are shifting to even have gone beyond prophylaxis with the factor. They are shifting to emesis sumab. I will come to that later. Now, what is this primary prophylaxis? Primary prophylaxis means you are giving regular continuous treatment. That is more than 45 weeks a year. Initiated in the absence of documented osteochondral joint disease. So, you have to examine the joints, either clinical or uh, with the imaging. And you have to give the treatment after the first bleed, but before any documented joint disease. Uh, and uh, before the age of 3 years. So the criteria are, you must start it before 3 years, after the first major bleed, and before the occurrence of any joint disease detected either clinically or by imaging. Now, secondary prophylaxis. Started after 2 or more, more bleeds into our joints. So it is taken after 2 or more joint bleeds. The other things are similar to that mentioned in the primary prophylaxis. Tertiary means started after the onset of joint disease. So even the secondary is before the onset of joint disease. But tertiary prophylaxis means this continuous uh, factor rate infusion but started after the onset of joint disease. Intermittent prophylaxis means treatment given to prevent bleeding for periods not exceeding 45 weeks in a year. So if you are given, giving factor prophylaxis up to 44 weeks, even then it is called intermittent. So to say that it is continuous prophylaxis, it has to be given above 45 day, weeks. Almost should cover the entire year. Now, short term prophylaxis means these are used in case of target joints. You give uh, intense physiotherapy with uh, 4 to 8 weeks of factor therapy to interrupt the bleeding cycle and uh, prevent the joint damage. Now, a few words about MEC sumab. 
it is a humanized bispecific therapeutic monoclonal antibody so it's a monoclonal antibody it is uh, it replaces the hemostatic function of activated fat rate it has no similarity to fat rate but it replaces the function of fat rate that is it can uh, connect the activated factor 9 to activated factor uh, factor 10 and produce an activated factor 10 uh, so it, because it has no f structural similarity to fat rate the presence of inhibitors will not affect the functioning of emesizumab emesizumab itself will not produce antibody and even if it is produced it is non specific so antibody production is not a problem for emesizumab and the other advantages are there's a half life of 4 weeks do you need to give a loading dose for the first month every week following that you can give uh, emesizumab every month the second advantage is it can be given subcutaneously so obese people obese children those having difficult iv access they can all use emesizumab so it can be used even in factor 8 deficient patients as well as those having inhibitors it is not useful in factor 9 deficiency realize dosage of emesizumab loading dose of 3 mg per kg as a subcutaneous injection once a week for four, four weeks so the loading dose is 3 mg per kg subcutaneous once a week for the first four weeks this should be followed by 1.5 mg per kg once weekly or 3 mg per kg every two weeks or 6 mg per kg every four weeks so you can be, you can use it every four weeks every month as a single sub q injection uh, in fact the western world has already shifted to use of emesizumab the only uh, negative but very important point is the cost of the medicine 30 mg cost around 45000 rupees so you can realize uh, the burden for a for an adult if you are using emesizumab hopefully the cost will come down in the coming years definitely in children with inhibitors uh, with the difficult venous access you can use emesizumab again remember emesizumab is only a prophylactic agent it's not an agent for treating hemophilics coming to immunization all routine immunization must be given subcutaneous is a preferred route im route can also be used for immunization with adequate precautions before giving the injections use uh, ice packs you uh, put ice pack on the uh, desired site for five minutes don't rub vigorously use the smallest gauge needle maybe 24 to 26 or 25 to 27 smallest gauge available needle then uh, give pressure for five minutes don't rub but after the injection give pressure for five minutes then you can observe the child for two to three hours see whether he is developing a hematoma only if there is a hematoma you go for factor therapy previously we used to give uh, factor first and then half an hour later you, we used to give injections but the studies sh show that uh, such a treatment such an immunization will lead to slight increased risk in uh, inhibitor formation because by giving uh, vaccination you are stimulating the immune system meantime you are uh, giving factor and saying no not to produce antibody contradiction so it is decided that you give vaccination with the precautions and uh, give factor only if there is a hematoma regarding surgery so if a surgery becomes necessary it should be done in an experienced center with experienced surgeon experienced anesthetist there should be facilities for monitoring the clotting factor level there should be facility for inhibitor screening and you need uh, sufficient clotting factor for the surgery that must be ensured so preoperatively you need an 80 to 100 percent factor rate level postoperatively it should be maintained as 60 to 80 percent during the first first one to three days 40 to 60 percent next four to six days 30 to 50 percent for the next seven to 14 days in fact um, you have two different protocols one for countries developed countries the factors are available easily but there is uh, for resource constraints those countries with resource constraints slightly lesser doses advice i will come to that so this is the protocol for surgery one important point is you have to rescreen for inhibitor at four to eight weeks after surgery because you are giving, giving plenty of factor so better you do a rescreening for inhibitor after four to twelve weeks four to twelve weeks now we go to the products available for treatment of hemophilia factor eight definitely the first and foremost this is used for treatment of hemophilia a we have both plasma derived and recombinant 
available as 250 to 3000 unit vials 250 500000 etc are all available even 2500 3000 vials are available the chance of developing inhibitor is the same for both plasma derived and recombinant then each unit per kg each unit of factor rate per kg intravenously will raise the factor level by two international units this is applicable to factor rate so one unit per kg will raise the factor level by two units per deciliter this is uh, related to some uh, intravascular distribution something related to molecular weight and all anyway one unit will raise the level by two percent or two units you can say they are infused at a rate not to exceed three ml per minute in adults and 100 international units per minute in young children then there is a theory of continuous infusion we are not using it but uh, it is said that it avoids peaks and troughs you can give a continuous infusion but you need to monitor them very closely then the, the cost of plasma derived factor is around 15 to 20 rupees per unit that is uh, roughly 25 250 units will cost some 4000 to 5000 rupees and the dosage this is very important weight in kg into required rise into 0.5 Required rise means for different breeds, the required factor level is different. For example, if you are suspecting IC breed, aim for 100% correction. If you are suspecting uh, joint breed, go for 40 or 60. For a renal breed, even 20% is enough. For an oral breed, maybe 20 to 30% is enough. So, we decide on the required rise. The formula is weight in kg into required rise into 0.5. Then, factor 9 concentrates used for hemophilia B. Factor 8 has a half-life of 12 hours, whereas factor 9 have a half-life of 18 to 24 hours. Again, plasma derived and recombinant are available, strength being 250 to 2000. In fact, what uh, the available, available uh, product in our setup is 600 units. Then each unit per kg intravenously will raise the factor level, factor 9 level by 1 interaction units, unlike factor 8. The cost of uh, factor 9 concentrate slightly more costly, 20 to 25 rupees per unit. And recombinant is even more costlier. The dosage schedule is weight in kg into required rise into 0.5. Coming to FIBA, these are used for patients with inhibitors. So, available as 500 and 1000 vial products. 500 microgram will cost around 32,000 rupees. It's a very highly, highly cost, uh, costly drug. The dosage is 50 to 100 microgram per kg. B BD in case of uh, mucous membrane breed, uh, in case of uh, joint breeds and 6th hourly in case of mucous membrane breeds. Then another product useful for inhibitors hemophilia A and B are recombinant factor 7A. It is otherwise called commercially called uh, Novo 7. It is available as 1000 microgram vials. Cost is even more costly than FIBA, 55,000 per vial. Dose is uh, uh, actually the dose is prescribed as 90 microgram per kg every 2 hours. That is till the bleeding stops. So, you may have to repeat it several times. But uh, but what we have found is, there is another dosage schedule advice, that is 270 microgram per kg as a single dose. May be followed by another dose, another 90 per kg after 12 hours. But this single dose seems to be very effective. And the decision between FIB and recombinant 7A, uh, different individuals uh, behave differently. There are times when FIB is not effective, whereas a single dose of recombinant 7A is found to be effective. So, it depends on uh, individual experience, individual decisions and the cost also adds to the confusion actually. Now, the other products, one is cryoprecipitate, not used nowadays. Cryopre cryoprecipitate is produced by slow thawing of fresh frozen plasma. You get some 80 to 100 units in a 30 ml pack. It contains uh, factor 8, von Willebrand's factor, fibrinogen and factor 13. And always remember, it doesn't contain factor 9. In fact, factor 9 is present in the supernatant cryopoor plasma, which in fact contains factor 7, factor 9, factor 10 and factor 11. Then the problem with cryoprecipitate is you need large volume and the risk of transmitting infections. Cryo is not subjected to viral inactivation procedures. So, we are not using it nowadays. Then fresh frozen plasma always available. When there, the risk of infections are there. You need large volume to lift the factor level to a required uh, level ffp 1 unit per 1 ml the content of factor rate is 1 unit per 1 ml the other agents used in hemophilia the supportive agents are one is desmopressin 1 d amino 7 d arginine vasopressin it's a vasopressin analog 
it uh, functions by releasing factorite from the from its storage sites but realize you need factorite storage for desmopressin to act so it is not useful in severe hemophilia where there is no factorite storage useful only in mild and moderate hemophilics the dose is 0.3 microgram per kg slow iv infusion in 50 ml of normal saline over 30 minutes once every 24 hours but with the repeated use the response will come down maybe you can use for one or two days it is also available as uh, nasal spray called stimate 150 microgram nasal spray are available uh, one spray to the one nostril is enough for a child whereas uh, two spray two doses that is 300 microgram necessary for adults again uh, as it is vasopressin analog beware of CR syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion so you have to monitor the urea and electrolytes and look at the osmolality and the rare risk of thrombosis very very rare risk of thrombosis coming to anti-fibrinolytic agents I mentioned earlier mucous membranes has abundant fibrinolytic activity so these anti-fibrinolytic agents namely tranexamic acid and uh, epsilon amino caproic acid they are useful in these mucous membrane breeds they competitively inhibits conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. So plasmin is the involved active agent for fibrinolytic activity. So here there is a competitive inhibition of conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. But it is contraindicated in urinary bleeds and uh, along with FIBA. You cannot use uh, anti-fibrinolytic agent along with FIBA. Also in uh, urinary bleeds, suppose you get a clot and you are using anti-fibrinolytic agent to retain the clot, you can have a uh, rare chance of a ureteric obstruction. So, contraindicated in urinary blades. But uh, they can be used along with the recombinant factor 7. Then availability, tranexamic acid is available as 500 mg capsule or tablet, also 500 mg per 5 ml syrup. Dose is 25 mg per kg, 8 hourly, you can uh, go up to 7 days. And also in a bleeding area in the mouth, either in the gum uh, or in the oral cavity, you can make a paste of this tablet, you can crush this tablet add some water like a 5 ml or 10 ml water make it a paste and uh, apply it to the bleeding site with some pressure apply it for 2-3 minutes and ask the child to swallow the same it can help to arrest the bleeding then EACA not very much used epsilon amino caproic acid dose is 100 mg per kg 6 hourly said to be less potent and more toxic mm, one of the toxicity being myopathy significant myopathy and even myoglobinuria can occur following EACA use now coming to specific hemorrhages, joint blade, how do you treat a joint blade? Of course first thing is factor replacement, the dose is 40 to 60 percent, aim for 40 to 60 percent, maybe for a day, sometimes more than that one or two days and rare cases longer if necessary. Then the supportive measures, you use the term price to describe the supportive measures, P stands for protection, that is avoid weight bearing, give rest, ice application. You put uh, ice, not directly, but uh, uh, it can be covered with a gauze and applied to the joint. You uh, put, put it on for ten, 5 minutes, then uh, 10 minutes off period is given. This can be repeated several times, at least for the first 12 hours. 2 hourly you can use it for 12 hours. Then the first 24 hours compression bandage also will help to reduce the bleeding. Then elevation of the limb is also an important step. This is uh, ice application elevation then prevention role of physical medicine exercise etc is shown now other measures are immobilization of the joint with uh, slings or splints then analgesics we routinely use paracetamol paracetamol is enough an excellent analgesic but uh, some cases it is extremely painful and we go for tramadol and at times uh, codeine sublingual codeine is also morphine group is also available then physiotherapy is after the joint function improves then as soon as the pain and swelling begin to subside change the position from that of comfort usually the flexion is a point uh, position of comfort now we change that position to uh, position of function and should strive for further extension and sooner the joint is in the position of function more and more active physiotherapy can be instituted this physiotherapy will prevent muscle atrophy pain i have mentioned we have paracetamol tramadol buprenorphin or codeine sublingual dextropropoxifen the dose of tramadol for children is uh, usually 2 to 3 milligram it will come to for a uh, 25 kg child it will be half tds mm -hmm. then these are the levels recommended by the world federation of hemophilia for each bleed 
Now we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, two protocols, one for countries where there is no resource constraints and one for countries where there is there are resource constraints. So we can consider Kerala as, a country, as an area without any resource constraints. We have enough fat rate in our custody. So the joint breeds, we aim for a desired level of 40 to 60 percent. Duration is 1 to 2 or maybe longer. For factor 9, it is again 40 to 60 percent, again same duration. For muscle breeds, same thing, 40 to 60 percent, 2 to 3 days. Iliosas is a more major bleed. You go for a higher percentage, percentage like that is 80 to 100 percent for the first 1 to 2 days. Then 30 to 60 percent for the next day, 3 to 5 days. In fact, you have to do repeated ultrasound, see that the hematoma is coming down and uh, decide on the duration of the uh, treatment. Again, factor 9, slightly less than uh, 80 to 100 percent. You aim for 60 to 80 percent for the first uh, 1 to 2 days, then go for 30 to 60 percent for the next uh, few days. CNS bleed, I said very important. Recognize early, even at the first uh, uh, contact, go for 100 percent. So, the first 1 to 7 percent go for 80 to 100 percent. Then a maintenance of 50 percent for 8 to 21 days. For factor 9, again, aim for 60 to 80 percent for the first 1 to 7 days. Then for 30 percent for the next 8 to 21 days. Ne throat and neck, again life threatening, go for 14 days, initially 80 to 100, then 50 percent. GAT, again can be life threatening, you can aim, if it is a significant bleed, go for a duration of 14 days the mentioned dose then renal in fact for hematuria you can adequately hydrate the child and wait for two, two days you can give twice or thrice the daily requirement and wait for 14 hours if the bleed doesn't subside you can go for a uh, factor therapy and significant renal bleeds require a 50 percent rise in factor level and should be maintained for three to five days deep laceration again you need to treat for five to seven days Surgery, I have already mentioned. Then for uh, areas where there, is, there are resource constraints, the duration is slightly less. The required percentage desired level is much less than what is in a, an ideal situation. So you can go for 10 to 20 percent for a joint breed. For ilio swas, instead of 80 to 100, you go for 20 to 40. CNS breed, when for CNS breed, you can come down on the desired level. That is, instead of 100 percent, you can aim for 50 to 80 percent during the first few days. So likewise in each breed you can come down on the desired level in a in a scenario where you have a source constraints resource constraints now a few words about inhibitors inhibitors are suspected when a <coughs> bleeding episode fails to respond to replacement therapy so inhibitors are actually igg antibodies against fat right the active component of fat right you have igg antibodies which neutralizes its procoagulant activity sometimes detected during routine follow-up and uh, the lifetime risk is around 25 to 35 percent that is a, that is a uh, one third of hemophilics are likely to develop inhibitors during their lifetime but the risk is uh, more during the initial exposures and severe hemophilics and uh, family history etc are all risk factors for development of inhibitors and they usually occur during the first 10 to 20 exposures the inhibitors are measured in Bethesda unit one Bethesda unit is the amount of antibody required to neutralize 50 percent of fat rate in normal plasma that is an equal amount of normal plasma so one Bethesda unit is the amount of antibody required to neutralize 50 percent of fat rate in equal amount of normal plasma now inhibitors are classified into two types low responders that is the inhibitor level is less than 5 Bethesda unit and high responders where the response is above 5 Bethesda units low responders are tend to be transient they will disappear in uh, next six months when whether you continue with fact right or not they will disappear in the next six months but high responders are unlikely to disappear they will be persistent and uh, the titer may even go up with uh, each uh, introduction of further factor so with each transfusion it is likely that the inhibitor level will go high and high so in low low responder titer does not increase above 5 even with further transfusion whereas in high responder titer increases more and more with the, uh, each transfusion now the treatment low responders as you are aware the inhibitor level is less than 5 bits per unit where you can give higher dose of factor so you give twice or thrice the recommended dose so that the inhibitors can be overcome and the bleeding will stop but for high responders where the inhibitor level will increase with each transfusion you have to look for 
other reagents. There comes our FIBA, our fact rate inhibitor bypass activity. The dosage of the, it is actually an activated prothrombin complex concentrate. The dosage is 50 to 100 international units per kg. Twice daily for joint and soft tissue bleeds and uh, four times for mucous membrane bleeds. Recombinant factor 7, as I told you, the dose is 90 to 120 per kg. Every 2 to 3 hours till the bleeding stops. The cause factor I have already mentioned. Tranexamic acid is still useful even if there are inhibitors. Now, there are uh, methods to eliminate the inhibitors. One is immune tolerance. Here what you do is, you give regularly, even daily, or at times, three times a week, high doses of fat rate, even 100 to 200 units per kg. Now the aim is to uh, make the immune system tolerant to the uh, new molecule. That is, fat rate is actually a new molecule for a se severe hemophilic. So you continuously give fat rate and make the immune system tolerant to the fat rate. It is a highly successful uh, treatment some 70 to 80 percent uh, it is effective but the problem is a high cost now other options are monoclonal antibody plasma pharesis and use of uh, immunosuppressants like cyclophosphamide pain management i have already mentioned so that finishes the topic thank you all for